Good morning, Walnut Village. We are working our way through the Old Testament book of Joshua, really a compelling story with some great lessons for us. We're in week five of our study, and today we're going to look at Joshua 4. Well, let's just pick up uh, to refresh our memory where we were from Joshua 3. We left off with the crossing of the Jordan River. And God told the people of Israel to wait three days at the shores of the Jordan River. And this did an interesting thing, because as they stood there, camped there, waited there, they could see the river swollen with spring rains growing in front of them. And for many of them, they must have just questioned Joshua, maybe questioned God. How can we ever cross this river? It's one thing for just a few spies to make their way across it, as we saw in Joshua 2. But as we looked last week at Joshua 3, we're talking about a nation of millions with all their possessions. How are they going to get across? And we saw that God would provide a way. Joshua then, uh, listening to God, gives specific instructions for how the crossing is to occur. First, the Ark of the Covenant is going to lead the people, something for them to focus their vision on in their trust of God. And he instructed the people to stay back a safe distance from the Ark, and it was for their protection because the glory of the Lord is so full of power and was his presence was in that Ark, and anyone that got too close well, it was in peril of their lives. But also, it gave them, again, that visual, that, that visual that God's presence with, with them, was with them and his awesome power available to them. So the people were to follow the ark just as they were to follow God. And as they crossed and made the new land their home, it would be important for them to build that trust in God, continue to build that trust in God. So God makes a promise to Joshua and tells Joshua that on this day of the crossing, God is going to demonstrate his power and in so doing make Joshua a great leader. We also saw last week uh, that we need to understand and assume that God spoke to Joshua and gave Joshua these instructions. But these instructions came because Joshua was in God's word, reading and remembering all that God had expressed to him, and remembering the crossing of the Red Sea. So Joshua was obedient to God, as we saw in chapter 1, and Joshua continues to have the word of God on his lips, on his mind, in his actions, and in his, in his uh, carrying out the directions that he gives the children of Israel and prepares to lead them across the Jordan. And that's a great reminder for us all to keep the word of God in our hearts, in our minds, on our lips. So led by the ark then, carried by the priest, they start to step into the water and the wall of water uh, from the river wells up on both sides and ground dry, dry ground is the result and all the children safely cross. And this miracle obviously connects with the miracle that the nation knew some 40 years earlier with the crossing of the Red Sea. And it's important just to note how God brought them out of Egypt's bondage with a miracle, and then what does he do? He brings them into the Promised Land with a miracle. Now, how long did this take? Well, we didn't mention that last week because we don't know. However, this massive undertaking demonstrates the miraculous circumstances surrounding the crossing which was orchestrated by God. Now for us, Jesus is the fulfillment of the ark. He is Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. We know that from Matthew 1, 23. But Jesus has cleared the way to victory over all things. And we read in Colossians 2, 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he, Jesus, made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them on the cross. And so we know from this, as we keep our eyes on and follow behind our victorious Jesus who conquered even death, then the river of impossibility that we face will dry up, will be on solid, rock-solid ground. And to face such impossible challenges in our lives, we must look always unto Jesus, who is our Joshua. He always is there, ready to lead us. All right, that brings us to our passage today, Joshua 4, verses 1 through 24. And again, 
this chapter is summarized in the building memorials to the Jordan crossing, remembering that great miracle. So we start with verse 1, when all the people had crossed. So Israel was now on the other side of the Jordan in the promised land. But what is life in the promised land like? Was it one of glorious vacation time after time? No, not really. We know that. For Israel, it was going to be and was a place of battle. But most of all, it had to be a place of trust. They knew that they had to trust God with everything that they were going to face because the challenges were huge in the promised land. But so were the blessings. So we read, when all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said, now st I stop here just to underscore, Joshua continues to take direction from God. He listens, he hears, he obeys, and he directs. And in that is where the miracle is allowed to happen, is where uh, leadership from God happens, is what builds trust in Joshua as a leader for the people. So the Lord said to Joshua, now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan and carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. Verse four, so Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. And he told them, go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God and each of you must pick up one stone and carry it on your shoulder. That indicates they must have been pretty big stones. Twelve stones in all, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. And we will use these stones to build a memorial. So here God takes time out uh, from the conquering and um, the, the continuing to make the land, the promised land, their own. He takes time out for Israel to be conquered spiritually. They can conquer Jericho under his guidance and that's going to occur, that's going to happen. But before it does, he takes the time with them to conquer them spiritually. So verse six, we will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These st stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the, the, the purpose of this memorial was so that the people of Israel could teach their children about the great things that God had done. And it was so that the work of God would not be forgotten among future generations. The lesson here is that we often fail in our trust of God because we forget the great things that he does. And often, the faith of our children isn't as it should be, isn't as strong as it could be. Sometimes it's even weak or non-existence because they have never been told how great God is, how real his working is in our lives. We don't back up the stories and the times where God has done real miracles in our lives in terms of teaching this and rehearsing this with our children. Verse eight then. So the men did as Joshua commanded them. They took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River, one for each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried to them, them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. So God here establishes Joshua as a leader so that when he gave a God-given directive, it was followed without hesitation. As you look at the story of Joshua and the children, oftentimes there are things that seem odd, and we're gonna see that particularly when we approach how Jericho is conquered. But without hesitation, because they've built trust in Joshua, because they have seen that he follows God and God performs miracles uh, in, his, in his life and walk with, with Joshua, his chosen leader for Israel, the people have faith and strength and the ability to trust Joshua, to follow him as a leader. And I often joke that if you think you're a leader, turn around and look behind you. And if no one's following you, then you're not a leader. And that wasn't the case with Joshua. He had the millions of Israelite people following him as their devoted leader who followed God. So verse nine, Joshua also set up another pile of stones in the middle of the Jordan. 
Now Joshua also set up this pile of, of memorial stones in the very riverbed of the Jordan so that when the water subsided, when it was lowered, maybe in a season of drought, these stones could be seen and would testify uh, for that time when God completely, in its, uh, in its rushing waters, um, set, set a, a part or set a time uh, for them to cross, completing a miracle. So when, when the river would dry up, it is especially in a time of drought that we need to remember the great things God has done. So Joshua sets this up. And then he takes another set of stones at the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. And they are there to this day. Now, just a note here, this, this scripture uh, was written millenniums ago. And uh, we don't know where the stones are today, but at the writing of this book of Joshua, the stones were still there to mark this incredible miracle. Verse 10 then, the priests who were carrying the Ark stood in the middle of the river until all the Lord's commands that Moses had given to Joshua were carried out. Meanwhile, the people hurried across the riverbed, and when everyone was safely on the other side, the priests crossed over with the Ark of the Covenant as, and the Lord as the people watched. So just stop here for a minute and think about this. Uh, the children of Israel, they're making this crossing. They're in the middle of this huge wide swath of land. They're seeing the water welled up on both sides and it says the people hurried. Now why do you think they hurried? Well, there might have been just that little modicum of lack of trust. I mean, if you would put yourself in their sandals, you're in the middle of this thing and you see this water welled up and you're also remembering the Red Sea miracle and how the water crashed down and wiped out the Egyptians, you may be thinking to yourself, how long will this water stay here welled up? And so you hurry through. Well, I think we all might hurry as we go through walls of water in our own lives. And we think what hurrying might mean in terms of our ability to absorb and appreciate God's miracles. If we just take a little bit more time in the midst of some of the trials to look for what God is doing, to see how he's answering prayers, to absorb and appreciate, we're going to be a much more trusting, faithful, uh, thoughtful people. Okay, verse 12. So the armed warriors from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh led the Israelites across the Jordan, just as Moses had directed. These armed men, about 40,000 strong, were ready for battle, and the Lord was with them as they crossed over to the plains of Jericho. Now, there's preparation, there's obedience, and there's faith, and these were all key, and God asks that of us as well. But sometimes, sometimes, God chooses in his wisdom to do Jericho miracles. That is, he spares us the hardship of the battle, and we're going to see uh, you all know the story of the walls tumbling down. We're going to see how that the, the battle, uh, the Israelites were spared of that battle. So the people content, this is just a, a little of information that comes from Joshua 1, if you recall. The people, some of the people were content, these three tribes, to settle on the east side of the Jordan. And they stayed on their side of the Jordan, but they kept their promise that they had made to Moses and to God. They sent their armies over, these 40,000 armed warriors, to fight on behalf of the rest of Israel, just as they had promised. And we read that in Joshua 1. Verse 14 then. That day the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. And for the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they revered Moses. God had kept his promise to Joshua, and the proof was that Joshua was revered as much as Moses, that the people trusted Joshua, celebrated his leadership just as much as they had with Moses. Verse 15, the Lord had said to Joshua, command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the riverbed. So Joshua gave the command, as soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came up out of the riverbed and their feet were on high ground, the water of the Jordan River returned and overflowed its banks as before. So the rushing, raging water returns just as it had once everyone was safely on dry ground. And the manner and timing with which 
the Jordan returned to its natural flow, its overflowing torrents, it shows that this event was supernaturally planned, arranged, and carried out by God. It was simply not a fluke. God encourages Israel with another display of his power and dominion over nature. And so, like children and like the Israelites, we all need reminders of lessons learned. And here God reminds Israel of the Red Sea miracle, of his provision for them continuously in the past, in the present with this crossing of the Jordan, and they need to look forward to the future and see that he will continue to provide for them. So verse 19, the people crossed the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month. Then they camped at Gilgal, just east of Jericho. And it was there at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. And we just need to stop and note that it was appropriate that this first work immediately, immediately, upon camping in the Promised Land was set up as a memorial to God's great works. This indicates that the children of Israel under Joshua's leadership put God first. They recognized the miracles, they recognized his provision, and they didn't let the normal day-to-day -day routine of setting up a camp, of feeding their children, of, of all the things that needed to happen get in the way uh, that would cause them perhaps maybe to forget to put God first, to worship God, to, to say thank you to God. So they set up this memorial to God's great works. Verse 21, then Joshua said to the Israelites, in the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? Well, we need to stop here because it is so easy for us to forget the great miracles God has performed on our behalf, right? We don't remember the past great works of God sometimes, causing us to live in a dreamland of the past, thinking that the best days of our Christian experience are behind us. But we really must remember the great acts of God as points of faith, points of faith from the past that will direct to the future. We can trust God for greater and greater works in the future because we have seen and experienced his past faithfulness. You know I've said this many times to you. If you want to know what the future looks like with God, look at your history with God. Look at the past. God is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He doesn't change. He's always faithful. Verse 22, then you can tell them this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes, and he kept it dry until you were all across, just as he did at the Red Sea, when he dried it up until we had all crossed over. He did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful. So there was a purpose here, a great purpose. Yes, God was doing something practical for the people of Israel, making a way for them to cross the river. He was doing something in this great plan for Joshua. He was making him a great leader, performing this miracle so that the Israelites would have trust in Joshua and follow. He was doing something for the Israelites' children. He was doing something that the Israelites could teach their children to build their children's trust and faith and reason for following God. And then we see here too, in the final verse, he did this so all the nations of the earth might know that the Lord's hand is powerful. This was his purpose for the world, so that they would know that there is a God in heaven who can work miracles, will work miracles, a God that they should seek with all their heart. So in God's plan, he's also thinking through how to encourage the nations to know who he is, to know he is God, and to follow him as well. Well, something I want us to consider as a result of going through this uh, fourth chapter of Joshua, and it's, and it's these two things. A miracle, and I get this from the dictionary, a miracle is a surprising and welcome event that we cannot explain by natural or scientific laws. God performs miracles in our lives, but often we miss them, don't expect them, or we don't look for God in these miracles. So think back over your life with God, and make a list, write it down, a memorial, not with stones, but write it down. Make a list of the miracles, the God interventions that you've seen in your life, 
and then share this with family or friends, just as the Israelites shared the memorial of stones and explained to their children. And then the second thing, armed with the knowledge of uh, how God has done miracles in your life, think about what miracles you need God to do for you or those you love and ask him to do those miracles for you now. Ask for miracles, make them a part of your prayer. And as you do, be sure to look for them as they will most certainly come. God is faithful and he continues to do miracles and will do so in your life. All right, our prayers for this week, they continue to be the prayers that have been on our minds for weeks now. Give thanks for the vaccine and the staff who provide care. This is a great milestone for our Walnut Village campus to get the vaccine. And then ask God to bless our new president, to keep him healthy, and to be sure that he will seek God's wisdom in all deliberations and actions, so many of, that are required of him. And then ask, ask God to heal our nation and to unify us in pursuits of those things that will bless many people. That is what um, the United States of America has stood for in the past, a generous nation giving to other nations, looking out for other nations, and we need to continue to do that. Ask God to fuel you with wisdom and hope as you read his word. Like Joshua read his word, we need to be in the word. And then finally, ask God to bring protection for your family and friends. All right, we will be back next week in Joshua 5.